Wait to hear this story. Sad, but true. Frustrating. Might make you a bit angry. But uh, we get to talk to a real American hero that had to go through a lot of crap, unfortunately. And I'm talking about United States Marine Corps retired Major Fred Galvin. He's got a book, of A Few Bad Men. Not good, a few bad. The true story of U.S. Marines ambushed in Afghanistan and then betrayed in America. That's the whole title, but that's really the synopsis of the story. I mean, this was a big deal. Uh, Major Fred Galvin, first and foremost, thanks for being on the show and thanks for your service. How are you? Thank you, Jason. I'm doing well, and uh, thanks for having me as your guest. We're, 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 before we start with this whole story, we're, every interview, you know, I, I do my best to research my guests for this show. And every interview that I've seen you do, you have like five oars behind you. And I don't see the oars. I was excited to see the oars so I could talk about the oars and what they meant. But you're not, you know, you're not in the oar room. Where are you at? No, I'm actually in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania uh, on a work assignment right here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So no oars. So there's a hotel. <laughs> so, um, this story, let's do a timeline first and foremost, because this really started when you became the first Marine Special Operations Task for you, you, you got command of the first Marine Special Operations Task Force, right? That's when this whole thing started, correct? That's correct. All right. So the timeline would be what year was that? So the Marines were forced into this. It was an arranged marriage, let's call it in 2006. So when 9-11 happened, Dr. Uh, Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense with uh, Bush Jr., he said, all the services, you will create additional capacity for special operations. And the Marine Corps resisted. Uh, special operations, uh, you know, largely Green Berets and Navy SEALs, they said, sure, more money and more manpower? Absolutely. That means more general and admiral assignments. They're happy to comply. The Marine Corps driven by a lot of egos said, you know, we tried this in World War II with the Marine Raiders and we didn't like it because for there to be an elite with an elite, someone has to be de dethroned, you know? And so in 2001, when Donald Rumsfeld, you know, ordered this, the Marine Corps continued to object. They thought, you know, Bush would be a one-term president like his father. And uh, then after the reelection in 2005, the Rumsfeld ordered the Marine Corps, you will activate a special operations command inside the Marine Corps, which they did in 2006. Rumsfeld was actually there at the activation ceremony, basically the godfather of this arranged marriage between special operations command and the Marine Corps. And we were the unwanted love child, uh, not to be uh, crying in my beer or, uh, you know, victimized, but, uh, you know, the Marine Corps didn't want this elite within elite. That's like having your the mistress meet the wife, uh, you know, we are the competition, like what the hell, like, you know, these guys, the Marine Corps didn't want us, the army didn't want to compete against us competing against their missions. So, uh, you know, this first opportunity, we were the first one out the door, like you described, Jason, we went over to Afghanistan, right on the Afghan Pakistan border. So the foreign fighters would come in, they'd get radicalized in Pakistan, and then they'd come across this border uh, checkpoint there and this little village right on the Afghan side called Body Co is where they would link up with their handlers. They would, they'd take them from there to Kandahar, to Kabul, to Sangin, to all across Afghanistan to fight the infidel. And uh, so we had intelligence that there was four of these suicide bombers. We knew their exact house, but just like when uh, prior to this evolution, the Marine Corps elite was called force reconnaissance. And as a platoon commander in force reconnaissance since the start of the war, we we were going to fight in Iraq. And if you had any intelligence, you could go and, you know, grab these guys and bring them back and detain and interrogate them. Um, in Afghanistan, they had this, you know, we were there to win hearts and minds. Everybody remember how that turned out? And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we go there, talk to the tribal leaders, have some chai, try to suss them out. Uh, they'd all, always, oh, there's no bad guy, no Taliban here. So um, as we were going into this village, which we'd been through there three hours prior at six in the morning, and that was a normal pattern of life, hustle and bustle, men, women, children at this bazaar, come back through at nine o'clock in the morning, totally different baseline change. 
men lined up on the sides of the road like a parade, just military age men, at ab complete absence of women and children. We were like, damn, something's changed. Uh, as soon as we are all in this basically, you know, on the road lined up in the middle as car bomb detonated right in front of us. Um, you know, it was a big van filled with fuel and shrapnel uh, detonated right on the front of our patrol. It, uh, 30 Americans in uh, six vehicles. And as soon as that went off, this van tried to come at perpendicular T-boning uh, that vehicle that just got hit. They had three jihadists hanging out the windows, firing AK-47s fully automatic. Uh, the, the Marines in that vehicle that just got blown up, the turret gunner stood up. He's on fire. This uh, sergeant he grabs his medium machine gun, aims in, starts gunning him down. There was a, another uh, Marine in the back troop compartment. That was an ambulance. It was a thinner skinned vehicle. And we thought that's why they went after that because it was not fully uh, enclosed armor like the rest of our trucks. Uh, so the other, uh, you know, corporal stands up in the back gets his light machine gun, aims in, uh, gives them the good news in that uh, sports utility vehicle that's heading at us, uh, quickly kill those in that vehicle, except for the driver who bails out into a ditch. He continued to fight us. But then we re started receiving a uh, fire superiority on the opposite side, on the right side of the road. This was dismounted jihadists. Uh, one would uh, suppress us, this echelon, the other would be maneuvering against us in this dry riverbed. Uh, so the, the first two vehicles aimed in and were you know, we're pouring fire at these echelons, just killing them. And then we were started receiving a sniper fire from this mountain, hitting the sides of our vehicles. Later, the Army's Criminal Investigative Division and analyzed the impacts. Uh, they had to, I will get this wrong because I'm, I just learned to walk up right. This metallurgic guys that analyze metals and stuff, they determined that the impacts on our trucks were from a Soviet dragging off sniper rifle. So we were receiving this fire. We were fighting back. A mob formed in front of us. They dragged a vehicle across the road. Uh, we reported all this simultaneous to our higher headquarters. So uh, later they said that we had a conspiracy that we tried to cover this whole thing up. That some the Afghans, all their stories were inconsistent. It's all in here. You got to get this book. A few bad men. But the Afghans were saying that we were drunk. That we use slingshots and we're throwing grenades to make it look like there was a car bomb explosion and that we went door to door that we dismounted which nobody ever got out of the trucks that we dismounted and went door to door just killing you know just sport killing uh women and children uh and americans believed it uh afghans you know they were given uh compensation salacia uh equivalent to four years average salary of the afghans so you know as you said, you know, you guys are from different parts of the country. Think of there in your, you know, yeah. municipality. If, if somebody was saying, hey, we'll give you four years average salary, no proof is required at all. You just go down, file a claim, zero proof, four years cash. Well, do, do, you, do you think, Major, that, you know, going back to the, the very beginning, I didn't want to cut you off because the story yeah. is just remarkable, um, that the Marines fought this special task force, unlike the other branches. Um, for, my first question is, is uh, I'm trying to understand, going back, back to the beginning, why would you fight it? it? Was it because in the Marines, you don't have an upper echelon of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a unit, unlike other branches? And then because of what happened and the repercussions from your own country, and we haven't even gotten to the other part of this story, but do you think you guys fighting this task force with Rum, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, that might be part of this issue or of, of, of the issue at the hand at the time? Oh, yeah. You hit the nail on the head. So Rumsfeld, he was basically the godfather with this arranged marriage, like I mentioned. He was pushing this and the Marine Corps, as well as the Special Operations Command, which is basically spelled A-R-M-Y, you know, the, the elite within the elite of the U.S. Army is 25,000 strong. Uh, so large, very established organization. Green Braves have been around for a while. Uh, and then we are this sexy young mistress coming in to compete against missions. So what do you think? The Army was uh, eager to have this uh, younger, very Spartan, smaller elite uh, Marine commandos come in and uh, compete for money and missions? No. You think the Marine Corps, which has a Marine Corps is an awesome organization. I mean, I joined when I was 17 years old. This is an organization 
found it in a bar in Philadelphia by the bar owner who was getting Marines, these local patrons drunk, saying that we're going to fight against the Brits, overthrow the most powerful nation in the world. So, I mean, that's a pretty awesome organization. It's like yes, the yes. owner became the commandant of the Marine Corps, handing out beers, getting guys drunk, saying, hey, we're going to wage some bloody war. And then these guys, you know, like attacking British ships, swinging across on ropes with swords as the ships are coming along, you know, like pretty, you know, pardon my technical terms, pretty badass organization. Yeah. You think the Marine Corps wanted, now we got these elite commandos. What does that make us? You know, right. you, you think your old lady would like, a, you know, see this, you know, 20 year old chick show up on, you know, <laughs> in the bedroom? Like, no. Hmm. So, uh, and they tried this, the Marine Corps tried this in World War II. Uh, they, they created the Marine Raiders in World War II. And after two years of them fighting, th these guys are out in the South Pacific, duking it out after Pearl Harbor. And the Marine Corps, with the stroke of a pen, said, it's not in the best interest of the Marine Corps to have an elite within an elite, disbanded them. And they went all back to the infantry. So uh, they tried this. They didn't want it. And here's a 21st century version ordered by uh, the godfather, Rumsfeld. So the first chance they got, when we got into Afghanistan, a friend of mine, I served with the Marine Force Recon. He was working for the CIA over in Afghanistan. He said, hey, Fred, I'm just a bearded guy. They see me in meetings. They don't know my background, but I've been hearing these uh, Green Berets. All they talk about is the first chance they get, they're going to kick you guys out. He's like, you just, and I couldn't even imagine. I thought my buddy was telling me, he was pulling my leg. I'm like, who would do such a thing? Like, aren't we supposed to be fighting together to win this war against the Taliban? You know, like, why would somebody want to kick another American out? But uh, you know, he was right. He was a harbinger and that's exactly what happened. The first chance they got. So I'm assuming your book, a few bad men, the true story of us Marines ambushed in Afghanistan and betrayed in America does not sit well with other branches. And even those that were in the administration at the time. Oh, nail on the head, Jason. So this book doesn't just name names. Uh, for those of us, you know, I, you know, I was a, you know, commando, so I just learned to walk up right here. You know, it's got pictures. Uh, these are black and white. So, you know, other fellow Marines would like eating trans, but you can color that in, but it names names. It shows their pictures and guess what? It says what all these generals voluntarily said to the press. Nobody was out there in front of a camera with their arm, you know, jacked behind their back saying, Hey. You know, this is what I got to say. No, they voluntarily said that. They chucked us under the bus. Other generals got in the driver's seat, backed that, you know, Mack truck up and, you know, did a did a few, you know, crushings of us. And then this shows a few bad men, shows the courtroom trial in depth. This is what it took 11 years to get, you know, like I just described, this is a gun battle. This was not Jason Bourne's knock list or locations of submarines at sea. There's no reason that anything in here ever needed to be classified. But in the longest trial in Marine Corps history, they went in a courtroom. Instead of using a court martial, they used this very rare courtroom trial called a court of inquiry. There's no rules of evidence. I'm not a lawyer, but ask any military lawyer. They'll tell you there's no rules of evidence. You can bring up conjecture. You can use hearsay. So they said, you know, the Marines went back and they, they had a conspiracy. They made up a story and all this kind of stuff. And every time, so they present that and then they go to defense. So when our witnesses or during cross-examination, anything that was exculpatory, they moved the media completely out of the courtroom. So although the jury heard every single thing, a jury, military jury, the, uh, the press, what the American people heard was just one side that we gunned down 19 Afghan civilians, wounded 50, that uh, we went on some shooting spree. We shot at every, you know, man, woman, and child at cars that we just snapped and went out of control. And then we went back to cover this whole thing up. And the facts, the sworn testimony, that took 11 years. There's, again, there's a security classification guide in the military that you cannot classify something for the purpose of saving someone for embarrassment. And that's exactly what they did. And they took 11 years hoping that maybe I'd get in a car accident or you know, some kind of tragedy and just go away. But here it all is. If So if your listeners, if they liked a, the combat action of 
you know, American sniper in Iraq, if they like the combat action of lone survivor in Afghanistan, if they like the courtroom drama of a few good men, this has it all rolled into one on steroids. There's more combat action from our ship takedowns in the Persian Gulf. We did 39 of those, all the intense raids and sniper missions in Iraq, the uh, combat action that we did as Marine commandos in Afghanistan in the courtroom trial. Uh, also, Read the blurbs on the back of the book. You can go on Amazon right now and read uh, movie producer Rob Lorenz, uh, produced American Sniper, Flags of Our Fathers, Letters from Iwo Jima. Uh, read what uh, former congressman, uh, former deputies under Secretary of Defense, who pre-read this book and wrote blurbs. It's on uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Uh, you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, this will be a book you read through and you just be like, how did this happen? And how did these generals get away with this? Because they all ended up getting promoted and promoted and promoted. Uh, the guys on the cover, that's not any of the commandos in our task force. These are a few bad men. So if you want something that keeps it real, that packs a Mike Tyson punch and I'll knock you into next week, a few bad men. Now, you know, I was a fighter, not a writer. So the co-author Salmana, this was professionally written by a man who's, uh, covered the most craziest cases, gone down the Amazon, seen, you know, you know, tribes that, you know, literally were cannibals, has interviewed all the old rapper gangsters like Tupac and Dre and Snoop Dogg. And I mean, when they were real, real gangsters, uh, but he's a real reporter, uh, wrote for Playboy, LA Times, uh, several outlets. And you, anyone, uh, you know, if you're a knuckle dragger, with no military background, you can pick this book up, easy to understand. It doesn't have a bunch of jargon and slang that confuses anybody. It's it's written in plain English. So, uh, go going into this conversation, sir, I did not in a million years think that we'd be able to fit Tupac into it. That, that's that 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 yeah. that's cool that we were able to get Tupac cool. into this conversation. <laughs> yeah, Salmana kept it real. He, uh, <laughs> it, he did an awesome job, and I'm not just trying. To, of course, I'm biased, but you know, I reread this last night on the red eye here to the East Coast, and uh, yeah, Salamana did a phenomenal job. So, so back to the timeline, um, and correct me if I'm wrong. After the, the this this happened in in Afghanistan, you were, uh, as far as the military goes, they said that that you did nothing wrong. You did not ambush. Uh, you did. Have, there was no conspiracy. You, you didn't kill inno innocent civilians. Like, I mean, there's all kinds of numbers thrown around from 19 to 60. I mean, none of that happened according to the military and, and the court within. But it wasn't until you came back to the United States where you had to be dragged through the courtroom drama and the media. I remember this this story, you know. And as a civilian, knowing that our brothers and sisters are men and women are over there fighting this fight and knowing that you can't trust the soul and you're trying to befriend. And I had a lot of friends in the military that were over in Afghanistan and they would tell me, I actually, uh, you know, when I was doing radio would do these, um, these drives definitely after Halloween and Easter to get leftover candy to send with them or to send over there because they would tell me that's like gold to get information from kids. You know, that, that you, you know, it's like a parade. You go through these different villages with your your tanks and you're throwing out candy because th th that was what the, the kid would come up and say, yeah, bad guy up there. So you wasn't until you got home is when the shit really hit the fan and they turned on you, right? Yes. You know, so the seed was planted in Afghanistan, like you alluded to. So, uh, you know, the, the real timeline, to be brief, we... Uh, Right after the ambush, BBC aired that we killed a woman 20 minutes. I mean, if one of you were killed right now, 20 minutes later, a national news source would not have a story teed up, ready to go on the airwaves in 20 minutes uh, was what they said was facts. But that's how fast this hit us. So the Afghans, the Taliban, I should say, uh, to be specific, were using these tactics where they have stringers with pre-made stories. So if they do an ambush, they kill us, they win. If we win on the American side, then they have this pre-made story that was going to be the narrative that pushed out sort of like a psychological operation and uh, or information warfare. So that hit us. And then they 
they re the Taliban reinforced that with inciting these riots. So all of Jalalabad, one of the biggest cities in Afghanistan, rioting. Uh, the governor cried out to Hamid Karzai, the president of Afghanistan. He publicly condemned us. Then what did the American generals do? They show some courage and support for the troops. No, they buckled, buckled, kicked us out, you know, support the troops. Boom. Uh, so they sent an investigator over there. He'd interviewed the first two teams, the first 10 guys, and not interviewed any Afghans. Interviewed for the first 10 guys of our patrol, and boom, we were uh, kicked out. Hmm. And you know how these things go. When a senior authority makes a rush to judgment, well, then investigation is going to suit, you know, the, the guy at the top. That's who they're working for. That's In the military, it's a little bit different than a jury, a uh, civilian jury or other investigations where there's not a connection. So, like, in the military, if you want to get promoted, you want to get a good assignment to someplace like, uh, you know, you're down there in the beach, uh, you know, your wife may like that, but you got to keep the puppeteer happy. So, you're going to do whatever Geppetto pulls your strings and tells you to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's exactly what went on. So, yeah, they kicked us. We went back to the United States. Then uh, somebody, a household name that you probably know, General James Mattis. He was lieutenant general at the time. He was a convening authority in our case. He uh, authorized 49 criminal investigators and four prosecuting attorneys. So dogpiling seven to one odds against the seven of us. And then they narrowed it down to just myself and one other that we were the co-defendants in the trial. So basically 49 against two. Uh, we don't fight any battles with those kind of odds, uh, but that's what it was going into this kangaroo court uh, where if that wasn't bad enough with all the command influence, then they, they had this Lieutenant Colonel who is the public affairs officer, the handler for the media, Usually some, you know, a young sergeant may do a job like handling the media, but they sent a, a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps up from Tampa for three and a half weeks to North Carolina, the armpit. So this guy coming up in January for a whole month, you know, to shepherd these guys. But why'd they send somebody that rank? I mean, did he really love the fried fish and the popcorn shrimp and the cucumber salads of eastern coastal North Carolina in January from Tampa? Hell no, but, you know, he's one of these made men that of course he got promoted to just like, it's all in the back of the book. What happened to all these guys, you know, cooperate and graduate, you know, get along and you get promoted. Uh, but every time that the Colonel in the court said, Hey, we're going to classified session. Why is anything classified? It's gun battle. Well, the media would just slide all the, here's the Lieutenant Colonel public affairs officer slide in the media slithering out, not even in the lobby two buildings over and on the second floor. So they wouldn't hear a damn word of what went on. And uh, that's what really crucified us in the court of public opinion. So they, they didn't come out. They didn't use any legal terms like innocent, guilty, or dismissed. They said we acted appropriately. So you know, this is the largest number of alleged Afghan civil, civilians killed by direct fire weapons. Uh, you know, then they took the longest trial in Marine Corps history. I'm in a capital offense case, and you don't end using any legal terms. You just say, hey, act appropriately. Maybe that's like in a debrief from a, a football game or a military exercise, but it's not. So that's why the press just said they never said they were innocent. Yeah. And so what was seven the more years we got crucified. What was the, no pun intended, the smoking gun that eventually got you acquitted? Interesting story to ask well uh you know we were acquitted and they use these milly mouth words but then uh you know congressman jones during the criminal investigation we were getting slandered by uh army senior army officers in the press so congressman walter jones who was a congressman for our district in north carolina stood up and he said uh these marines rights have been maligned you know why do these united states marines not deserve the presumption of innocence and, uh, you know, so he fought for 12 years, literally, he was a congressman until he died, and he fought to clear our names. And he actually had a uh, act of Congress, the House Resolution 21 in the 115th Congress. For two years, it was sponsored, saying he wanted a comment on the Marine Corps to make a public statement saying that we, an official statement saying that we were not at fault for the ambush on 4 March. For two years, comment on the Marine Corps didn't act whatsoever. And uh, 
And then people say, well, in 2019, you guys were fully exonerated by the Department of the Navy. You know, the Marines is in the Department of the Navy, we're the men's department. And the people say, well, the service finally cleared you guys. True, but not true. So the service did, but I remind you that was a panel of senior civilian leaders in the Department of the Navy. So no one in military uniform ever stood up and made any public statement. Now that Department of Navy report was an explicit 12 page detail. It named names and you really, I mean, if you wanna see what happened and how ruthless when people have complete power and can cover things up, I mean, this shows where all the bodies are buried. This book is red because it's radioactive. And, uh, you know, I'm surprised, you know, you know, I'm not going to get assassinated for, for writing this, but it's got, when it has all this stuff from the courtroom, this, the, the last half of this book, the courtroom trial is all in quotes. That's what I fought for 11 years. Those are their exact verbatim words under sworn testimony. So if they don't like it, you know, cry me a river of tears, but that's what they said. And when you read this, you just, and it has how they got caught lying under oath, like and nothing. Well, I should say nothing. They got promoted. You know, right. this is the so, whole total social virtuing, you know, hey, toss these guys under the bus, these frontline foot soldiers down the trenches, literally fighting their way out of an ambush and you get promoted. Wow. That's so, how our senior military right now in today's military, you were seeing how Russia can't effectively even fight with their massive numbers and technology in Ukraine. And, and thankfully, but uh, America is being led by also, also led by incompetent leaders. Uh, you read this book, this is nonfiction. Uh, this happened and these guys are still in circulation. So if you're concerned about the largest employer in the United States, buy a few bad men yeah. and uh, read it cover to cover. So I know, especially when it comes to the Marine Corps, how important code is to you guys, code and honor, and, and, and that's, that's great. And I want to play devil's advocate here for a second, Major, that you're putting this book out and pretty much airing the dirty laundry of not only the United States government, but also the United States Marine Corps. Um, and I see more and more people in the military or in politics when it's all said and done, they do these like kind of tell all books from whatever their story is. Um, isn't there kind of a, I don't know what the word is, but like, are some of your peers looking at you going, Fred, what are you doing? And we know it was bad. We get it. It's over and it's done with right now. You don't want to ha bring this up again and hash it out again. You're just going to make us look bad. That's the code. You don't do that. Yes. A lot of military, uh, senior military officers, had a, a reporter I know who said, you know this guy, you know, retired senior Marine officer, he keeps calling me and saying, why are you, you know, writing and covering this story? And uh, so there's been a lot of people, you know, fake social media accounts trying to, you know, on LinkedIn, Facebook, trying to say I'm crazy, that I'm dying, that I'm, you know, like they're literally trying to do this information warfare still uh, hacked into one of my other accounts push stuff out, trying to make it seem like this guy's off his rocker. Uh, so this book uh, doesn't paint people in the, I mean, it's gone through the Pentagon's Office of Pre-Publication Security Review, so the senior generals, they know what's coming. And uh, this isn't uh, putting a mint next to their pillow and giving them a, a good night kiss. Uh, this, in the purpose of me breaking ranks is, you cannot have incompetent commanders who literally, one of the quotes, is I'm willing to sacrifice the lives of these Marines. Now, this after a guy dropped, you know, a total of one bomb and two surface fired rockets right on his own guys and says twice, confirmed by my polygraph, I'm willing to sacrifice the lives of these Marines. So when you have sociopaths, okay, you guys have cousins, relatives, this is the largest employer in the United States. If you took Amazon and Walmart until just recently, but if you combine them, until just recently, the Department of Defense, with all its active reserve civilian contractors, was larger. But Amazon can't send you to jail, and Walmart can't send you, put you on a bread and water confinement diet, but the Marine Corps and the military can, and they do. Wow. And so if you're cool with having, you know, family, friends, and the largest employer in the United States subjected to just rank abuse, well, then turn a deaf ear and, and don't, you know, but 
if you really, this book explains, you know, the problem and how we need to fix it. And it also lets listeners and readers understand that if you're facing something that's larger than yourself, this story wasn't just about surviving in combat in Iraq, as well as in Afghanistan and in the courtroom and moving on with your life, but having a successful life, uh, that can be done and it can be applied to other people's lives, whether they're having severe health issues, professional career issues, uh, relationship issues. This shows how to fight and win against something that's larger than yourself. And sometimes like this story, it may be a campaign, not a quick fight, maybe something that took me 15 years. Uh, but when, you know, I work at Tesla and there's this big sign uh, and I can't quote it verbatim, but it says, uh, when it's important, uh, you will, you will fight no matter what the odds. And uh, that's why I think, you know, when, when you've got cancer, you just don't give up and die. And when the, the cause is something as important as the health of our national defense, it needs to get exposed. The cancer needs to get cut out for the whole body to continue to fight and be, uh, have a long-term good health. And uh, right now, you know, we're in hospice. Uh, these guys have infected the whole entire military and it's an important story to tell and read. And, uh, you know, we can't just sit there and say, ah, you know, that was a terrible story. You know, pour me another beer. Well, uh, what do you got to fix this problem? What do you do at Tesla? Uh, I'm a manager at Tesla. Like so you're high up. I can't speak on behalf of Tesla, but, uh, you're, by big, contract. but you're a big <laughs> dog at Tesla. Uh, relative that's a, <laughs> you know which is a, is a miracle that uh it truly is i mean when i was the poster boy for mass murder for war crimes and uh -huh. i applied this book says you know i did i handcrafted tailored 700 resumes but when you're the photograph and you know i was walking the courtroom they were always taking the pictures of me as the commanding officer this special operations task force of commandos that butchered this village in body co uh you know, I was a, when I re was forced to retire, uh, I was an entrepreneur for four and a half years because after 700 applications to all these jobs all over the globe, nobody would hire me. So yeah. then I went back and worked as a government civilian for four years and, and then just, well, you know, I, was, used testing. I was just really getting at, are you buddies with Elon? No, no, no. You ever met the guy? No, no. We were trying to figure out if, uh, Elon Musk runs for uh, president. If you had to go against Dwayne the Rock Johnson, who would win? Who would you vote for? Maybe that could be a, a tag team match. You know, you smell a little of what the Rock's got cooking, and you have Elon. <laughs> so you got the hammer and sickle, the the brains and the brawn to like. I mean, you know, now the media doesn't cover that North Korea is launching all these missiles again, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, China is like doing all this provocation in the Straits of Taiwan. Uh, that's that's not the kind of stuff that would be going on if they saw like, damn, you got Elon Musk and you got the rock, you know, like people be like, that's a tag team. I don't want to get involved with. So, we were, we were split on the show. Uh, myself and Nate were, were pro rock and Nate's reason for not going with Elon Musk was because that if uh, things got going tough, you know, if we got into some tough times, I think, would you say Nate, like an asteroid were to come that he would just get on a, one of his spaceships and leave and the rock would stay and fight and uh brandon you were pro elon musk well i forget what the reason was pro something stupid yeah, i was hoping he'd do like maybe like a fun random day like take everyone to space day that's right. like take america up to space and we'll hang out for the day <laughs> <laughs> tell me all right uh a few bad men is the title of the book with major fred galvin uh nate question for the major yeah, uh, a few bad men. Like this story is great, and it almost sounds familiar. And to me, it it's very close to the story of the movie The Rock. Um, you know, other than you know, you guys didn't obviously take over Alcatraz or anything. But this this book could be turned into a movie. Um, if if it was turned into a movie, you, I mean, in The Rock, you would be Ed Harris. But who would you have? What actor would you have play yourself if if you turned a few bad men into a movie? You know, that's. That's not for me to decide, but you know, uh, you can go on Amazon right now and pre-order it on the back of the book, the actual physical book, and on Amazon it lists uh, you know Rob Lorenz who made uh, a few, not a few good men. He made a American Sniper, Flags of Our Fathers. He was a producer of those and uh, Letters to Iwo Jima. So 
uh, I don't make those decisions. It's like at Tesla is way above my pay grade, but, uh, you know, don't wait for the movie. And, uh, you know, if you liked a few good men, definitely this is, has a lot more all distilled. So this is the Mike Tyson punch. And I know your listeners, they can handle, you know, the big saying, uh, you can't handle the truth. They, America needs to, and they can't handle the truth. Um, so what so. I got, what I got from that major was that there's already a movie talks in the making and there's already been somebody picked out and you're deterring, you're deflecting away from Nate's comment because you're afraid you're going to slip up and tell us who it is. And, you know, we can see you for those that are, uh, watching the snaps can, uh, can see you uh, on, on our YouTube page or on our social media, but you look like the love child of William Defoe and Kevin Bacon. Uh, William Defoe. compared me to William Defoe. I don't look. <laughs> yeah, a, you've got that. You got a William, a, a William, William Defoe and a Kevin Bacon with a splash of Ryan Reynolds, you know, with a splash, just a, a little splash of Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Uh, sell a book. So, you know, you gotta, you can, if people have a hard time reading, you can listen to it on audible. Uh, so don't wait. Some of those things take a long, long time, but this is actually, I mean, it's, it's a complete nonfiction story. And, uh, if you want to hear the whole thing, I mean, we had to go from 432 pages down to just over 300 and it describes in detail, like screenplays, 120 pages, a minute per page, uh, a lot gets left out because they don't have the time to put it into a film. So, uh, you, if you, uh, if you want to wait to see what the rocks got cooking, uh, or you want to read the the whole story, uh, a few bad men. That's uh, it's what you need to remember. Is I wrote the book about a few bad men, and did you, your did listeners you, can. Did you do the read. audible? Did you did you voice the book? No, I didn't. Oh. It's uh, I was not. You should you know should have reached out, Fred. I would have loved to have done it for you. Yeah, yeah, totally <laughs> would have done it for you. Uh, quickly, Brandon, you got a question for the major. Uh, yeah, we talked to this guy named uh, Rick Prado. He's with like the CIA Black Ops, uh, and we were talking to him um, a few weeks ago. And he was telling us like when he watches like any movies, like war movies, he just can't watch some of them because they're so poorly depicted. Is there like a movie that's really gets on your nerves because it's super poorly depicted? You know the uh, not to pick on you know, but I know there's so many Navy SEALs that come out with these books and movies, and it's really hard these days to have a uh, a publisher write a book just because it's kind of been spoiled and you know the market on the military shelf has been oversaturated but uh not only do the navy seals have a corner on the book market the movie you know that one in particular the act of valor you know it shows these guys coming in and you know some guys subsurface diving underneath the water and a sniper's out there he comes up perfectly timed does the headshot and the guy falls down and catches him right before he splashes like you're shitting me. Like, come on. <laughs> I, I would hate to watch a war movie with you. You would ruin everything. You're like, like come on, man. It's not happening. I've been to that village. They don't do that there. It's yeah. not Anybody happening. who was a commando realizes, like, it's nothing is, you know, combat is not a noun. It's a verb. You know, there's enemy involved. They do it. You know, it's, it's not all sexy. And so, yeah, movies tend to spice it up uh, more than the recipe card really asks for. So. Um, without getting into it, because we're going to let you go here, but, but I am curious. I wanted to make sure I asked this question to you with your story that you tell in a few bad men. Um, how often does this happen in our government in our military? Good question. And this is not an isolated case. And that's really why I've been pounding the table. Uh, there are three, you know, commandos right now that are assigned to the Marine Special Operations Command, same, same organizations I was in. Uh, these are two Marine gunnery sergeants and a Navy corpsman who's a chief. These are senior experienced uh, enlisted operators. Uh, also uh, accused of homicide. So these guys were in Iraq. This happened, uh, you know, three and a half years ago, and they're still waiting a court martial. Uh, so a drunk, retired, 275 pound bodybuilder, Green Bray, comes in. And why the media is not covering this, he, I, I don't know. But the Marine gunnery sergeant, hands down by his side, he was trying to de-escalate things, but this big retired Green Beret was, you know, 
two blows smashed this uh, Marine gunnery sergeant, African American, by the way, media doesn't seem to care. Uh, you know, a much smaller guy, almost half the size. This Green Beret comes in, clocks him twice in the face, and then this other Marine uh, gunny comes in, uh, saves his mate, punches the drunk Green Beret in the face one time. That's it, one, one blow. The guy falls down, hits his head. He was choking on his vomit. He ended up dying four days later when they medevaced him to Germany. And uh, so these guys, all three of them, to include the, the black guy whose his crime was he got punched in the face twice. All three of them charged with homicide. So when you wow. have an organization that's, you know, fueled with ego and there's a rush to judgment, there's often this unlawful command influence because in the Marine Special Operations Command, when you have a jury, this is a closed loop system. It's not like the civilian uh, legal system where the civilian legal system the judge doesn't influence your your retainment, you know. But in the Marine Corps, that in the especially Mar Marine Special Operations Command, the jury is picked from the Marine Special Operations Command. So if you want to get promoted, you want to get retained, you want your next assignment, it's all coming down to uh, the commanding general. So in their case, nobody wants to speak up and stand up for these guys. I mean, it's killer clear case of self defense. So this does unfortunately go on. And just put yourself in their shoes. Can you imagine walking around whatever town you're in or your listeners are in and you're with your wife or your family and somebody assaults one of them, you know, twice, a violent, you know, trained killer. And I mean, what does the Marine Corps expect? Do they expect, I mean, would they have applauded if, if they just let this guy continue to pummel this guy and beat his head into the ground? Uh, I mean, self-defense, we have a, a right of self-defense and, uh, Actually, the rules of engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan say if one of your force is being assaulted, you will be charged if you do not take action. And uh, I mean, but you talk about the size and scale. I mean, of this is, you know, basically a counterattack like we were counterattack, but instead of with weapons like we use, they he just hit him with one punch in the face. That was it. No weapons, no curb stomp, not in charge with homicide. So, yes, Jason, unfortunately, this is not a, a one off. And hopefully these guys don't have to write a sequel to uh, A Few Bad Men Part 2. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we just ask that people pay attention to these types of cases that are ongoing. There's, like ours was called the MARSOC 7. Theirs is called the MARSOC 3. And people can research it because it's currently in progress, unfortunately. Well, we saw it, too, with Nick Cage defending his wife's honor with a couple drunken bar guys. And they just would have found that damn knife. He wouldn't have served all that time in jail on B-Block. But thank God he did because he ended up on the plane to stop Cyrus the virus. You know, well, that's right. That story. <laughs> All right. Uh, a few bad men. That is the book. Pick it up. Absolutely fascinating. Major Fred Galvin, United States Marine Corps, retired. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you for telling the story. And you saw, you tell it so well. I mean, obviously you were there, but it makes people like us, like you kind of let us in on what is going on. And there's right and there's wrong. And uh, you guys were right. So best of luck with the book. And you're more than welcome to come on the show anytime, sir. Thank you again. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, guys. Nate and uh, Brandon. Appreciate it. See you. Thank you, Major. Take care. Good luck with the book, sir. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.